So I see the big flash of light come out of the phone, hits me in the face and throws me back like a rag doll. And it really threw me backwards. And that's when things really got interesting because as I was being thrown backwards, all of a sudden I had this very strange sensation of moving forwards. My guest today is Dr. Tony Sicoria, MD. He just prefers Tony. He's a practicing orthopedic surgeon who had a near-death experience back in 1994. And he's here to tell us what caused his NDE and some of the pretty amazing things that have happened to him since then. Tony, welcome, and thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you. I appreciate being invited. It's pretty crazy, this opposite ends of the earth thing, isn't it? Oh, it, it is absolutely incredible. To, you go through life thinking... Is there going to be a tomorrow? And here I am talking to somebody in tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. So I guess you're a guarantee that there is a tomorrow. Exactly. Yeah. I'm Friday, you're Thursday. Tony, would you give us a little bit of background on your life up to the day of your NDE? And then we can go from there. Okay. I grew up in upstate New York, Kingston, New York. I went to the Citadel, which was a military college in South Carolina, in 1970. And when I graduated, I went to get my PhD in physiology. And I had the great honor to work with Albert St. Georgie my senior year in college. He was up at the Massachusetts, one of the oceanic labs, and I'm drawing a blank. At any rate, I thought for sure that I wanted to be a scientist. And I went to get my PhD, and when I finished, the options were limited for what I wanted to do. I could be a, a, a lab rat in somebody's basement, and I thought that this it's not what I thought it was going to be. At the time, I was in love with the idea of the old scientist, and they would go for walks in the park or around the lake and share great ideas and help each other. And all of that disappeared over time and it became a publisher parish environment. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to take it a step further and I decided to go to medical school. So as soon as I finished, I continued at the same place at the Medical University of South Carolina and, and decided to get my MD and as I was going through that, trying to decide what type of physician I wanted to be, I decided I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon because I was always one of those kids that liked to take things apart and put them back together again. So it seemed like a natural aptitude for me. And so I did that. And in 1988, I started working. And we were in upstate New York, a place called Oneonta, New York. And... My wife normally would have a big party every August. And in this particular August of 1994, was going to be at a place called Sleepy Hollow Lake in upstate New York, which is just below Albany. And that's where we're going to have this big party. About 25 people, lots of kids running around. And my wife had rented a pavilion to have this multiple birthday party at and I was elected the cook and that's uh, the way the day started and then as I was out working the barbecue I thought I hadn't checked on my mom because she was not there and I thought I better go call her so I I got somebody to cover the barbecue and I walked around the front of the building and there was a payphone attached to it and I'm going to give my mom a call. And I picked up the phone and I dialed her number and let it ring four, five, six times. And she never picked up. So I was, I thought, oh, I'll try again later. And as I took the phone away from my face, I heard a huge crack. And I saw this big flash of light come out of the phone and hit me in the face. And I knew exactly what it was. It was a like a lightning strike. What I hadn't realized because I was paying attention to the grill was that a storm cloud had brewed up over the lake that we were next to and I hadn't been paying attention. So 
I see the big flash of light come out of the phone, hits me in the face and throws me back like a rag doll. And it really threw me backwards. And that's when things really got interesting because as I was being thrown backwards, all of a sudden I had this very strange sensation of moving forwards. And I remember standing there thinking, how is this possible? I know I got hit. I saw it. And I knew I'd been thrown back like a rag doll. And here I am standing and I'm looking around. I look at the phone and the phone is just dangling and nothing's making any sense. And at that point, I hear my mother-in-law screaming and I'm down at the bottom of the stairs and everybody else is up on the first floor. And I hear her screaming and all of a sudden she's running down the stairs right at me. And I'm thinking, it's not good when your mother-in-law is screaming and running at you. And as she got down in front of me, I could tell that she couldn't see me because she was looking off to her left. And as she got to the bottom of the stairs, it was like I wasn't even there. And she just took off to the left. And I thought, what the hell is going on? And so I started to follow her. And I took a few steps following her and all of a sudden I'm confronted with myself on the ground and I remember looking down and going oh shit I'm dead it was, it was a shock I guess all of my life I thought that when you died there would just be some sort of notification either who knows what it was but I didn't expect to have it not even be known I thought there'd be some bells or whistles that would go off, but it was absolutely nothing. So I'm standing there and I'm looking at myself on the ground. And as this is happening, my mind is racing like crazy. And I'm trying to make sense of this. And all of a sudden I'm saying to myself, wait a minute, I'm thinking just like I normally would. And I'm obviously not in that body that's on the ground. I'm standing out here. I can hear everybody, I can see everybody, but nobody can see or hear me. And I'm trying to get their attention and nothing seemed to work. And then I saw this lady who actually was waiting to use the phone behind me. And she started to get down to do CPR. Turns out she was a nurse from one of the local hospitals. And how fortuitous is that? Mm -hmm. Get struck by lightning to have somebody waiting to save your ass from going to the other side. So she got down and she starts doing what she's supposed to do. And at this point, I'm thinking nobody can see me, nobody can hear me, and I'm feeling stupid. And I thought, I'm going to go check on my family because they were upstairs. And my wife and my three kids are up there. And I thought, I'm going to go up the stairs and see what's going on. So I walk over to the stairs and I start to go up and I get to about the third stair and I'm looking down at the stairs because I always am afraid I'm going to fall face forward on the stairs. So I always watch what I'm doing. And as I'm looking down, I notice that my legs are starting to dissolve. And I thought, whoa, this is getting really intense. And I just kept going up the stairs. By the time I got to the top of the stairs, I had lost all form. I was just a ball of energy. And the stairs go off to the left, and I said, what the hell? I'm not going to go up the stairs. I just went through the wall. And when I got to the other side of the wall, I came out right over the top of where my wife was sitting, and she's painting children's faces. And I made a mental note of where the kids were, where who was standing where, who the kids were, and what pattern they were standing in. I don't know why I did that, but I did. And... Later on, I verified that was exactly the way they were standing and traveled through this room. And when I got to the other side of the room, I was going on a diagonal and I went through the roof and suddenly I'm outside. And that's when things really got crazy interesting because it was like I had fallen into a river of pure positive energy. And it wasn't anything in this river of of energy except absolute love and absolute peace and it was just it was absolutely shaking to experience it because it was devoid of anything else 
And it was this bluish white light and it had a sparkly appearance to it. And it made me think of when I was a kid and I'd be swimming in a crystal clear stream and I'd see the sun shining through the water as I was underneath the water. And it reminded me of that. And as I was looking at this light energy and I could tell what it felt like. And as I looked around, I started to see that whatever this energy was, it actually made up everything. And I could look at the trees and see the energy flowing into the trees and everything was made up of whatever this energy was. And I thought to myself, I'm thinking, this is the God energy. This is what everything is made of. And I thought, it's so powerful. I can, I could measure this. And so my science brain is kicking in going, we can, we could look at this. I'm like, but the more I looked at it, I could actually see the energy pattern and it had a sine wave pattern and I could see it flowing and it went through everything. And at this point I could tell that I was moving someplace. I had no idea where I was going, but I could feel speed and direction. So I was accelerating in, into something, but I had no idea what. And at this point, I've become absolutely euphoric over the fact that this is the greatest thing that could ever happen to somebody. And I, I had a short period where I saw high points and low points in my life, almost like a collage of pictures just showed me pictures and this and this and that. And there wasn't a lot of emotion around it. It was just, these are things that happened in your life that were of some significance. And there was no explanation other than the fact that they just passed on. And so I settled down and I'm floating in this river of pure positive energy. And I'm thinking, again, this is the greatest thing that could ever happen to somebody. And I was just excited about where it was going. And then all of a sudden, it was like somebody flipped a switch and I was back in my body and I was pissed. I was like, no, don't make me go back. Hey, you can't do this to me. And I quickly realized it's not up to me. And I'm laying there on the ground and in the place where it hit me in the face and came out my foot. It felt like somebody had taken hot pokers and stuck them in both of those places, but I'm still unconscious. And the lady who was next to me had stopped CPR. She just kneeling next to me, but I still can't open my eyes, or look at anybody. And so it took several minutes before I had enough mental function to be able to open my eyes and say anything. And at that point, I just embarrassed myself because the first thing I said to this lady who's kneeling next to me and saved my life. I said, it's okay. I'm a doctor. And she just kind of laughed and she said, well, you weren't a minute ago. And I thought, okay, none of this is making sense. I'm just making a fool of myself. So I'm going to shut up, which I did. And of course the police and the ambulance came and I said, no, nah, I'm not going. When you get struck by lightning, you're either alive or dead. There's not much in between. And it, at that point I said, just talked to my family and I said, take me home. Let me see my cardiologist to my neurologist and let's, let me just get out of this. So that's what happened. And so they took me home and I saw my doctors and everybody said the same thing. You're lucky to be here. And I was like, okay, but I was tormented by what did it mean when I started to think about it and everything in life is a series of probabilities. And I started thinking about what's the possibility or the probability of a bolt of lightning, several million volts worth, striking a building, losing enough of its current by the time it gets to you that it doesn't turn you into a French fry. It just stops your heart. And then I think, and what's the probability of having a nurse standing behind you so that just in case you got a little too much, somebody was going to be there to jumpstart your heart again. And when I started looking at all this stuff, I'm thinking there's nothing random about this. And as Einstein used to say, God does not throw dice. 
And that's true. And I'm a firm believer that everything happens for a reason, but I was given no reasons. I had no idea. And I was haunted by the fact that this thing had happened and I had no idea why and what it meant or what I was supposed to take from it. And then shortly after that, it was about two weeks after the event. So after the lightning, it took me about a week to get the circuits running again properly. That first week, I could look right at you and say, I know who you are. I'll be damned if I can find your name. It's locked in a box someplace up there and I can't get to it. And there were a lot of things like that. I just, I knew that I knew something, but I couldn't get to where that file was. And after a week that disappeared and it seemed like everything was back to normal. But about another week or two after that, I started having this really incredible desire to hear classical piano music, which was a, a really strange thing for me because I was a kid of the 60s. There was rock and roll and there wasn't much of anything else. My mother had made me play piano when I was seven years old. She had made me take lessons for a year and I, out of obligation, I did that. Actually, probably under threat of life and limb, but I did it and never had any interest and never went back. But all of a sudden, I, I can't do anything without thinking about this absolute desire to hear this. And it was so strong that I drove an hour to Albany, which was the nearest big city that would have classical piano music on CDs. And I went into this music store, and as I walked in, it seemed like there was a CD that just jumped off the shelf into my hands. And it was Vladimir Ashkenazi playing his favorite Chopin. Ashkenazi was one of the famous Russian pianists. It is one of the famous Russian pianists. He's still alive. And at this point, I didn't know what to do with all of it. It was just, I was so taken by this, the music. And I started listening to the CD and I listened to it nonstop. And it made everybody else listen to it. I'm sure they were sick of hearing it. But... I just couldn't stop. It was just a compulsion that had made no sense to me. But within a very short period of time of listening to this music, I realized that it's not going to be enough to listen to this music. I need to know how to play it, which was a big problem since I didn't have a piano and I didn't know how to play. But I was undeterred. And the very next day, one of our babysitters came to the house and said, I'm going to be moving and I have this old upright piano I need to store for a year. Could I store it at your house? And I'm thinking, well, okay, this is really getting weird now. So all of a sudden I have a piano and she loads the piano in the house. And I'm thinking, all right, now I need to know how to learn how to play. So I went and bought a couple of books and kind of try to teach yourself to play. And at the same time, I ordered all the sheet music from the CD, which is magical thinking. I don't know what the hell I was thinking. There are people who have been playing this stuff for 10 years and still wouldn't attempt to do that. But it didn't seem to matter. I was determined to learn how to do this. And so I started to try to teach myself. And within a few more weeks of that, I go into bed as normal, but all of a sudden I, I have this dream. And in this dream, it was like an out-of-body experience. I'm actually I'm walking out onto the stage and I'm walking toward myself. I'm way out on the front edge of the stage and I'm at a, I'm giving a concert at this concert hall and I'm listening to this music that I'm playing. And as I'm walking up behind myself, the thought comes to me that this is not somebody else's music. This is mine. And I thought, okay. So I, I start listening intently to it and I walked up behind myself and I'm listening to what I'm playing and I'm watching everything and I'm looking at the concert hall and the ending had this loud crashing ending and it woke me up. And I, so I got up and I sat on the edge of the bed and I looked around and it was 3.15 in the morning and I walked out to the piano and I thought, let me see if I can plunk some of this out that I just heard. I had no idea. I 
I didn't know how to write music. I didn't know how to read music. And I sat there and I could pluck out a few notes of what I heard, but I didn't even know how to write down what they were. And so I said, the hell with this. And I went to bed and I woke up always at 5 30, 6 o'clock because that was my time to get up and get ready for work. And from that moment on, whenever I went near that piano, the music from the dream would start to play in my head. So whenever I sat down at the piano, it was like a tape recording. It would just start. And if I didn't pay attention to it, it would become intrusive. It would actually start playing when I was trying to work or when I was trying to do something else. And so I learned very quickly that it was kind of like a two-year-old. He really had to pay attention to it or there was going to be some repercussions from it. And so this process went on and I continued trying to teach myself and I picked out a few of the pieces from that CD that I thought, well, I'm going to learn these first. And I started trying to teach myself. And one day uh, I'm banging away at the piano and my daughter's best friend, Jackie, was over at the house and her mom was coming by to pick her up and she came in the house and she heard me on the piano and she came in and said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm trying to learn this piece of music. It was called a fantasy impromptu, a piece of Chopin. And I said, I don't understand why the hands don't line up in this piece of music. And I said, why would somebody write a piece of music where the hands don't line up? And she said, they're not supposed to. And I said, why? And she said, it's called a polyrhythm. And I said, I'd never heard of that word before. And I was like, why would anyone do that? And she said, I'm not even going to try to explain this to you. You need to get a teacher. So at that point, she gave me the name of Sandy McCain, who was the chairman of music at Hartwick College in Oneonta, New York, where we lived. And I called up Sandy and told her this whole story and asked her if she'd take on an old guy to try to teach him some piano. And she did. And we started working two hours a week. The only time we had in common was five o'clock. So five o'clock was our piano time, five o'clock in the morning. So I'm sure that her family was not real happy with me, but that was the best we could do to, to meet the two schedules. And so this went on for quite some time. And then as I'm learning to play, I'm also working on the music from this dream and as I learned how to do things, I would write down a measure or two and I'd stuff it in a drawer someplace thinking someday I'll get back to all of this. And I kept working on learning how to play. And I started going to a music camp, a piano camp for adults in Bennington, Vermont, which was called a Sonata. And it was, it's a group of people. They would meet four or five, six times a year, different people. And at different times, and it's all people that are absolutely obsessed with piano. And then this is their week of indulging themselves. And so I started going to that in 2002. In 2006, when I went, the owner's sister, Erica Vanderlyn Feidner, Erica was the number one salesperson for Steinway in New York City. And she had just left Steinway and went to Bosendorfer and she was there at the piano camp and she brought five pianos in for people to play on, which was an absolute treat. And we got talking about all of this stuff and the music and the music from the dream and the things that I was working on. And afterwards she said to me, there's only one person that can tell this story and that's Oliver Sacks. And at the time I didn't know who Oliver Sacks was other than the fact that he wrote the book Awakenings when he figured out how to treat Parkinson's disease. He is a famous neurologist. And I didn't think anything more of it. And so I went about my normal business and it seemed like that was in May, that meeting was. And in June, I get a phone call from Oliver Sacks. And 
I'm like, this can't be real. And Oliver says, I've heard about this lightning story, and I'd like to have you come down in New York City to interview you. I'd like you to be one of my patients. I have a collection of people like you who've had unusual things happen. And I said, sure, that would be great. So in August of that year, 2006, I went down to see Oliver Sacks and I got to spend the whole day with him, which is an absolute treasure. This was a man who could think circles around anybody I knew, including myself. And he, we spent the entire day together, which I will never forget. And at the end of the day, we're standing in the doorway and saying goodbye. And he looked at me and he had this piercing way of looking at people. And he looked at me and he says, the music from the dream went through an awful lot of trouble to get here. The least you can do is write it. And I was so taken with what he said. I went right home and it was about three hours to get back home. So I had plenty of time to think about it. But when I got home, the next day I went right out and bought a music writing program called Sibelius, which is the equivalent of music writing for dummies. And if you have an electric piano, you can hook this thing up so that you can play something and the music actually appears on the screen. And so that was the way I started because by that point I had gotten to where I could play some parts of the music from the dream, but I had no idea how to write it. And so I spent the next seven months, every minute that I wasn't working, writing down this music. My goal was to get it written for my next May piano camp. And so that was my goal. And so when piano camp came around in May, I had finished the music and played it for my piano friends at this piano camp. And everybody liked it. And I thought, okay, this is pretty cool. While I was there, I got a call from Oliver. And he says, I wanted to ask your permission to, to use your story in my book. And I thought, I don't have anything to hide. Well, sure, go ahead. He said, good, because you're chapter one, and it's coming out July 23rd. He said, we got a little ahead of ourselves here. And sure enough, my story was published in the New Yorker magazine, the July 23rd edition, 2007. And at that point, all hell broke loose because this was, I hadn't been telling a lot of people about this story and because I didn't want people to think I was crazy. And suddenly it got taken out of the closet and thrown out in everybody's for everybody to look at. And about a week after it came out, I got a call from a guy named Carlton Clay. Carlton was the head of the music department at State University of New York in Oneonta. And Carlton says, I read this article and he says, I'd love for you to come and teach a class. And I thought well, that would be pretty interesting because I like to teach and do those unusual things. And I said, sure. And a week later, he calls and says, I'm getting inundated with phone calls about this thing. He said, would you consider playing the music for the class? And I thought, I'll do that. And then it seemed like it was another month or so after that. Carlton calls again and he says, you won't believe it. I'm just getting hammered with people calling here and everybody wants more and more. And he said, would you consider doing a concert at the Performing Arts Center? And I said, no, I don't have the faintest idea how to do something like that. I said, I'm not musically trained. I'm not prepared. I have no idea where to start. And somehow he conned me into doing it. And I said, okay, I'll do it. So the next phone call I make is I call Sandy, my music teacher. And I said, Carlton conned me into doing this thing. And so I I said I would, and it's going to be in January of 2008. And I said, can you get me ready for it? And she said, it's going to be a lot of work. She said, you got to be prepared to put three or four hours a day 
into getting ready for this. And I'm like, okay. We start on this process. We would go up and to the performing arts center and she would make me walk out on stage and make me walk off. She would make me talk to the crowd and then make me play the music. And I can still hear her. She'd be up in the top row of the seats and I'd be playing away and she'd go, I can't hear you. God, this is going to be no fun. But we worked along. And then about a few weeks before the concert, Carlton calls me again and he says, things are changing again. And I said, what are you doing? And he says, the BBC One wants to come and so does German television and so does Granada Media. So there's three huge sets that want to come and film this thing. And I was like, oh my God, I've come too far now. What am I going to do? I said, okay. And so along comes the concert day, which actually turned out to be my birthday anyway. And there's three television crews. I remember going to the green room right beforehand. And I remember sitting there and I'm talking to God and the angels, anybody that wants to listen. And I said, you guys put me through a lot to get me here. I said, don't embarrass us both and leave me out there without a lot of help. And thankfully, I managed to get through it. And the music from the dream and a couple of other pieces that I had written along the way and managed to get through it. And ever since then, it's taken on a life of its own. So I've played that music all over the country. And it's interesting, the reactions that I get to it. People will come up afterwards and tell me about, they see visions or they feel certain things. And I've even had some people ask if they could come and lay on the floor underneath the piano so they can feel the vibrations of it. Because there's something in the music, something in the frequencies of the music that stimulates certain brain activity or certain behaviors. And it's interesting. I think there's more to the music than I have any concept of. It's so far over my head, but I do believe that there are healing frequencies and there are frequencies that stimulate brain activity in people. And it's just based on the things that people say. Tony, do you think that was possibly the end game in mind? If you consider that we make a plan for life before we come here, do you think that the fact that the music is healing was the ultimate intention? I think that there's some truth to that. I have been searching for an understanding of how all this fits together ever since it happened. And I literally read hundreds of books trying to understand and I think what it really comes down to is that we have no real concept of how the brain works and how it's connected to other things and other places and, and the frequencies that exist in the ether, or the quantum field, as some people call it, and how all of it interacts and how it can help to reprogram your brain and so is some of the aspect of this music about helping people to reprogram some part of the brain that they don't have access to or, or could help in their evolution. I don't know, but I've often wondered that. Just going back to when your NDE first occurred, did you start talking to your family? Did you tell your family about what happened straight away? I know you didn't talk to many people, but how long was it before you said, oh, this is actually what occurred? I told them pretty quickly, but I was very selective about anyone else. So my family was the ones that I told about what I had seen and, and how it all seemed to fit together for me. And some people thought I was just hallucinating. Some people didn't know what to think, but I knew I was absolutely certain of the things I saw and the things that I experienced. And as I had begun reading as much as I could get my hands on about people who've had similar 
sorts of things. There's a commonality that people have who've had a near-death experience. They all see very similar things. They experience similar things. There was one that sticks out in my brain is Pamela Reynolds. It was a famous case. And Pam had an aneurysm in her brain, which is a balloon that's going to burst. And when it does, you die. End of story. Unless it can be found and have surgery. And so she was having headaches and she saw her doctor and he did the appropriate test and found this aneurysm. And he sent her out to the Barrows Neurologic Institute in Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona. And Dr. Spetzler was the surgeon that she saw. And he was going to do a new procedure on her called standstill. And what they would do is they would take you into the operating room. They would hook you up to a cardiac bypass machine, put you on bypass, and then they would drain all the blood out of your brain. So it was a bloodless field. And they would do the surgery, and then they would put the blood back in, restart your heart, and hopefully you would wake back up again. And this was a pioneering procedure that she had done. And what was interesting was after she lived and after the surgery, she was taken to the ICU. And when she was in the ICU, she started telling everybody about all of the stuff that happened to her when she was proven clinically brain dead and cardiac standstill. So this woman's heart has stopped. Her brain has been cooled to 60 degrees and verified absolute flat line, no electrical activity in her brain. And yet she was able to tell them exactly where all of the equipment was set on tables, who was in the room. She was able to give conversations that the doctors were having while she's under anesthesia. And then at one point she left her body and she initially went up and she was sitting over Bessler's shoulder, and she was watching what he was doing. But then she said an opening occurred up toward the ceiling. And so she went into the tunnel. And when she was in the tunnel, she met some of her family who walked with her a short ways. And then they turned her around and said, you have to go back. And she said, hell no, I'm not going back. This is pretty nice over here. And they somehow managed to get her back. And I think it was her uncle or grandfather, I can't remember which, who, when she was standing at the edge of the tunnel, pushed her out. And that, that coincided with when they started her heart. And she had a vertical memory of everything that happened, the things that people were saying in the room, who was in the room, music that was playing in the room. And one of the things she really objected to was... When Spessler left the room, you had the residents were closing the wounds and they put on music from the Eagles, the Hotel California. And she was very upset with one particular line. It said, you can sign out anytime you like, but you can never leave. And she was very angry about that because that was what she experienced. She didn't want to go back in her body. She wanted to go wherever the tunnel took her. But the fact that she was able to be aware of the music and the things that were being said and the, the instruments and what the instruments sounded like. There was an instrument that they used in the surgery called a Midas Rex. It's a high-speed drill that they used to cut through bone. It has a god-awful sound. As it cuts through bone, it really gets your attention. But she made the sound to a T of what it sounded like, what it looked like. And it's not possible to do any of those things if you're truly anesthetized and they had visual proof that she was because they're recording her brain, they're recording her heart. She's flatlined, both things. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't say she must have had light anesthesia or she had some way of knowing these things, but there's no way. It's an interesting parallel of the things that she experienced and what I experienced. I think as a Dr. Eben Alexander, I'm sure you probably read his book, 
that's another good example. He's a neuroscientist, right? And he was completely like prefrontal cortex, completely wiped out. And he had all these memories. You mentioned the quantum field. It's almost like the information is stored there in the quantum field and the brain is really just a reducing mechanism to, to access it. There are a lot of studies that are starting to suggest that, that memory somehow exists in the quantum field and we don't know how to access it, but some people do access it accidentally most of the time. One of the things that happened to me after the lightning was I got contacted by Daryl Treeford, who's a physician, and Dr. Treeford is a specialist in savants, and he has a whole group of people with similar stories to mine, but they've all had different injuries. They've either gotten hit with something in the head, they had surgery, any number of different things. But afterwards, they all had developed something they didn't have before. And so there's enough of people like myself and them that make you think, okay, there is something normal about the ability to get those qualities. And I think the problem is we just don't know how to access them. We know we can do it accidentally and somebody gets hit in the head and suddenly they can do incredible calculations they had no idea how to do before. Or like myself, you hear music and the music's coming from someplace. Where is it coming from and how does it make its way into my brain? And again, there's a lot of people that are starting to believe that this memory exists in the quantum field, and nobody really understands what that is exactly and how we communicate with it is a whole other black box. Did you acquire any other abilities, anything that you would consider to be supernormal, paranormal after your NDE, apart from the music <laughs> coming through? Yeah, the only other thing that did come out of it was that I can feel people's energy, their aura, as other people would call it, and it feels like static electricity out of not having a better word to describe it. Everybody's is different. And if somebody has something wrong with their shoulder, for example, I can, if I happen to bring my hand near their shoulder, I'll feel this distortion of that electrical energy. And so if I move down the arm, it'll disappear. But as I get closer to where the problem is, I can actually bring somebody to tears with it. So that there are some things that I don't have a, a real understanding of, but I have just noticed that they exist. And I, I use them as tools to help. If I'm trying to figure out what somebody's problem is, I can use that as a way to narrow the focus of what I'm looking at. I've had flashes of knowing things that I have no way of knowing I'll have a feeling somebody's going to call and, and the, the phone rings or I walk over and I pick up the phone and they're on it. But those things, there's no way to quantitate any of that. And there are enough people that have things like that happen anyway that you don't know whether it's meaningful or not. But these are things that I didn't really notice before. And when you say you sense someone's aura, is that just a feeling you can't actually see anything? I know people that can see it, but I have only on occasion been able to do that. Most of the time I can feel it without any problems at all. Uh, seeing it, I think is harder. Uh, at least it was for me. One of my other guests, I mean, he had a near death experience. He said that he became quite empathic, so he can feel what people's emotions are like. Have you had anything like that as well? Not as much. Certainly emotions are concentrated in people in different ways. So if somebody has an enormous amount of tension and it tends to concentrate in their shoulders and upper back, that will cause a huge electrical disturbance if I put my hands near it. There's things like that you can pick up. So is there anything fundamental about the way you view life that's changed since your NDE? Absolutely. I'm absolutely certain that there is no such thing as death. We change forms, but our spirit lives on forever. 
whoever we are, we always are. And that I'm absolutely certain of. We keep going through this reincarnation process. And at least from what I can understand, the rationale behind it is we have to reach a certain level of evolution, spiritual evolution, to be able to be able to rejoin the source from where we came. And we just keep going through this process till we have enough points to be able to do that, to graduate from this spiritual density to the next one. Tony, I'm starting to run out of time here, but I wanted to ask, uh, people are probably going to have questions for you. Is uh, there some way for people to reach you, assuming that that's something that you're open sure. to? Sure. My email is tcicoria at yahoo.com, tcicoria at yahoo.com. And certainly, if somebody's got a question, feel free to ask. All right. I'll put that in the show notes. And so do you have any other like a final message for people before we wrap up the interview? I think that the only real message that I have is there is life after death. And I think it's really important to have an approach to life that is other than self and being more concerned about others than about the self. I think it's a big part of how our spirits are supposed to work. I suppose if we're not so concerned about death, then that's a natural sort of evolution, is it? We become more interested in what effect we have on others. Yeah. Yeah. Tony, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate you taking the time. I know it's really late over there. And I'm sure that people will get a lot out of this interview. And I appreciate you coming on. Anytime. Thank you for inviting me.